Thanks for coming. Um, it's, good, it's good to see me here. It's been a while since we've done face-to-face uh, -face difficult times. Um, hope you're doing okay. It's been a tough year, more than a year, especially here in Hong Kong. So it's, uh, it's good to see you, even if we're behind uh, masks and all that. Um, yeah, so this uh, session here uh, is going to be an introduction to judgment and decision making. I'm trying to it's kind of difficult behind the mask, but anybody here also taking advanced social psychology? No, so all of you, oh, right. Sorry, oh, last year. Yeah, yeah, of course, you're in, I mean, I mean this semester. Yeah, so some of the things I'm going to uh, discuss here, the first half of the lecture repeats uh, the stuff that I uh, done yesterday. So apologies to you, to you, to you uh, for having to go through this again. Um, typically, I spend the first session talking about what is referred to as the replication, reproducibility crisis. Um, and then I'm talking about the science reform, everything that's happening right now in science. Uh, however, I don't want the two courses to overlap too much, which is why I took that part away. And I'll uh, give you some links if you want to the recordings of the other course. But a lot of things that we're doing in this course are influenced by what, by what is happening in psychological science and science overall. So if you want to know more about why are we doing what we're doing in this course, we're doing a lot of hands-on research projects, um, then you can go and visit the Advanced Social Psychology where we'll be discussing a lot of these things. But the emphasis of this course is different. However, the first 40 minutes or so, I will tell you what it is that we've been doing for the last three years. Those who were, were with me uh, last year uh, know about this uh, from uh, personal trauma involvement in everything that we've been doing. Um, so if you want, you can actually talk to them about what it means to do uh, projects in this uh, course. So most of these 40 minutes are for us to align expectations. So hopefully one of the two uh, will happen. I'm hoping that the, the first rather than the, the latter. Either I will convince you to be motivated about this course and to take part in what we're doing here. This is a very different course than most of the other courses at HDU. I think generally in Hong Kong, this is, uh, doesn't happen very often. Um, or I will convince you that this is uh, too different for you to take part. And then it's completely OK for you not to select this. This is an elective. So you can choose many other electives in HKU. But it is important that if you decide to stick with us, to stay with this course, that you understand what you're getting yourself into. Because there are going to be some challenges. This is not an easy journey. There's lots of things that need to be clarified. And you'll figure things out as you go along. So a lot of clarifications are coming up. So. <clears throat> Just so you know, uh, this uh, lecture, everything that we do this semester is also broadcasted on Zoom. It is recorded. It's going to be public, not only on the Moodle, but it's shared with the world. So everything that I do, I edit this afterwards to make sure that you know, it's uh, concise. And then I also upload this to uh, YouTube. So you can, if you want to, you can always share some of the stuff that, that you see. And this is also kind of like a preview to the mindset of this course, that everything that we do in this course, everything that I do and everything that you do, is going to be shared with the world. So it's not only that stuff that you do and submit, you submit to me, and maybe the TAs uh, will see this, but everything that you do, your peers are going to see this. They're going to provide you with feedback, so we give feedback to one another. We go through the scientific, academic process of doing peer review, but not only that, but everything that you do will be open for the world. You will do this on a Google Doc. 
and scholars, real professors, real academics, real people with experience will come in, look at your Google Docs and provide you with feedback. So everything that we do is in the spirit of open science. Everything is open to the world. This is how we learn. This is how we find mistakes. This is how we improve. So everything that I do is going to be open science. Everything that you do is going to be open science. Uh, our syllabus, very important that you go over this syllabus in uh, detail. It's uh, very, very long. Uh, I think 30 pages and some of it links to the other syllabus where it has all the grading criteria. So overall about 43 pages of a syllabus. The reason why the syllabus is so long is because this is kind of like setting expectations. It's a bit like a contract. You will understand what you're getting from me and you will understand my expectations of you. In addition, the reason why it's so important that we have this contract is because the journey that you will go through with me does not end at the end of the semester. We will be collaborators. We will be co-authors because everything that you do in this course will be submitted to journals. So afterwards, together, we'll be co-authors. I will keep sending you updates about what's happening with what it is that you did in this course so that you'll finally, it might take two, three years, but finally, hopefully, your name will appear on an academic journal publication. So for that, we really need to understand one another. I need to know that you're with me. You need to understand who I am and what it is that I'm about, which is why on the syllabus, there's a quiz. It's impossible to fail this quiz. You just go through the quiz, answer all the questions. It just makes sure that you understand what you're getting yourself into. But by the end of the ad drop period, the end of the second week, you will need to do this quiz. You cannot participate in this course without taking this quiz. So very important that you go through the syllabus and you understand what this course is about. It is about open science, collaboration, teamwork, us doing real scientific work hands-on. Like I said, everything that I do is open science. Therefore, everything that we've done last year in advanced social psychology and judgment decision-making is on YouTube. This is kind of like what's gonna happen with this course as well. So playlists, you can go through, share whatever you want. Uh, all the tutorials are recorded. So that's great. You can just uh, prepare yourself. You don't need to come into a tutorial in order to listen to um, what the TAs are, are saying. You can prepare in advance and then you can use, make use of the tutorials in order to really discuss your projects to get real help from the teaching assistants. In addition, if you missed something from the lecture, you can go and revisit this. In addition, I give workshops. These workshops are open for the entire uh, Hong Kong University community. So for example, two of the workshops that I gave last year were about how to do pre-registrations and register reports. You will learn what those are and how to use Jamovi, R, and JASP for your science projects. If you're a little bit worried because you don't have a lot of uh, statistics background, it is okay. You need to know a little bit. You need to have some hands-on, like you ran a t-test or a correlation, and you know what a p-value is. So we require basic understanding of statistics. If you didn't do introduction to statistics or introduction to psychology, talking about methods, it's going to be a, a bit of a problem. Um, but if you have a basic understanding, we'll try and give you uh, the training in both the methods and the statistics. Plus, because everything is teamwork, everything is group work, it's very important that you find teammates, groupmates that can complement you. So some of you perhaps are very good at one aspect, let's say writing, you're very good at looking up the literature, you're very good at summarizing things, and some of you are better at methods. It's good to create a work group that uh, collaborates together, that complements one another. So the group does not depend on one person. It doesn't depend on you knowing something specific. It depends on how well you collaborate within a group. I, as a scholar, when I collaborate with other people, I don't know everything. A lot of the people I collaborate with have skills that I don't have. I learn a lot from working with my students. My R skills are okay, but some of the students that I work with can do amazing stuff far beyond what I can, uh, what I can personally do. So it's important to learn how to use other people's skills in order to create something meaningful together. 
for you to decide if you want to keep or drop uh, this course, you can look at all the materials. Everything is shared on something called the Open Science Framework from previous years. So you can look at all the presentation, all the hands uh, In addition, you can also see I share very openly all my evaluations, the good and the bad. And there is some bad um, because there are some complaints about all sorts of things that keep coming up, which is why it's very important to align expectations. I try and improve every semester, but I feel it's really important for you to be able to decide if you want to collaborate with me to know my strengths and weaknesses. So you can go and look at the, both the course and the teacher evaluations. You can also see my teaching philosophy on this portfolio. And I'll discuss a little bit about this big project that we've been doing in the last three years. If you want to know more about that, there's a three hour video where I explain all these amazing achievements by the Hong Kong University students that joined me in the last three years. You can go over here uh, to see more, more about that. This is the uh, big uh, web, web page that includes everything, um, all the publications that we've done in this project, all the people that are involved, uh, videos, everything else. Everything is on this page. Plus, if you want to know more about what is open science, what is this buzzword, what is it that we'll be practicing, there's a different web page also on my website that you can uh, visit. So now I'll begin the series of warnings. My teaching philosophy started with my postdoc. So I'm a fourth year here at HKU. Before that, I was a postdoc in Maastricht University in the Netherlands. And 40 years ago, Maastricht University was built on the concept of problem-based learning. So rather than a professor like me here now, standing in front of you and telling you, look at the truth, this is the truth, follow my truth. Rather than doing that, everything is conducted in small groups of students working together and the teacher is in the background. So this is the traditional model of how we used to teach or how we still teach at HKU. Typically in a regular semester, I would be closer to you, maybe we'll be in a circle, uh, less of me standing, and teaching and more of you doing stuff. But this is an honor, unusual uh, time, so we have to adapt and I will do this and people in at home. So I will be doing some of this, but there's gonna be a lot of you conducting things. Uh, this year, three, four months ago, this book came out by uh, a thinker in organizational behavior and psychology called Adam Grant. I really like this book. A few books came out talking about this mindset, a scientist mindset on how you learn best. And I really like this chapter number nine that talks about rewriting the textbooks. So rather than me telling you what the truth is, it's very important for you to go and figure out to be able to assess what the truth is. What is reliable evidence? When you're faced with all sorts of things in your social media, how do you know what is the truth and what is not? One way is to come to me and say, you're the professor, Please tell me, is this true? But that's not sustainable. Plus, professors are human. They have their weaknesses and their biases. We learn a lot about biases in this course. So the way for me to educate you is not to tell you what the truth is, but how to seek the truth. So I really like this. Teaching students to question knowledge. When you see knowledge, how do you evaluate this? And adopting all these principles of a scientist mindset, humility. So a lot about uh, the stuff that we're going to do in this course is not me telling you uh, what the truth is, but for me to uh, invite you to come with me on a journey for us to figure out together what the truth is. Learning by doing, so you have real hands-on scientific projects. Well, you'll be doing replications and extensions. You'll be doing science assessments. You'll be doing an evaluation of a certain phenomenon in judgment and decision-making. And we need to really embrace confusion and we really need to embrace uncertainty because science is messy. Science is complex. There's no 100% guarantee uh, for almost anything in social psychology, but also in the exact sciences. It's not really clear uh, sometimes what is re reality. And it all involves humans, even with vaccinations, even with pandemic, humans are a key ingredient. So making sense of uncertainty, making sense of confusion is really important. So we need to listen to experts because they have a lot of experience, but we also need to be able to tell who is an expert, what is valid knowledge.
Um, finally, and I really believe in this, and I'll show you some evidence for this, uh, science, uh, science can be informed by students. So the traditional view, when I started working with students, people told me, students can't do science. We need to tell them what to do. We need to tell them what the knowledge is. And then they'll go and implement this in the industry or if they want in academia, wherever they are. But my view is that you are the most undervalued, highest quality stakeholder in science. We don't involve you enough. So I think embracing humility is also for the professors in academia and understanding that we need to work together with you in order to get you to understand science and to do science. And then you are bigger numbers. So if I will do science on my own, I can contribute two, three papers a year. And if we work together, we can really increase the scale, scale up by a lot. How do we do this? This is kind of like the approach of problem-based learning. You will be working with teams. In these teams, you'll have a team contract while you set together your goals. I will give you an assignment. I will give you something to work on. I will give you a problem. This is why it's called problem-based learning. And I will not tell you everything about how to solve this problem. You will have to tackle this on your own. I will guide you. The teaching assistants here are here to guide you. We have a lot of templates. We have a lot of guides. We have experts that will come from the outside and help you. But it is going to be your journey. I cannot guarantee that this journey is going to be successful. But you'll learn a lot by taking this journey. So here the instructor is just part of the group. Actually, in Maastricht University, we're not supposed to even interfere. So the group does everything. Everybody contributes. They create their own minds, mind maps, and they create their own discussion, so forth. If you want to see how things are done in Maastricht, you can click on the link above. Plus, I based my philosophy on some um, papers that came out showing that we can really teach something called a replication, repeating, um, again, some of the published findings, so running these experiments again. And I really believe in this message over here, why students are the answer to psychology's replication crisis. So there is something that's happening right now in science overall. There is some questions that have been raised about what is the replicability of findings, not just in psychology, but in uh, science overall. And I really believe that students are the key answer uh, to addressing this kind of crisis. So the principles for me in my classes are this. So the student-led, the students seek out information. Uh, the students do actual science. So not just make belief, not just simulations, but you actually do something that matters, that has a real impact, uh, both for you and for the community outside. Real impact scientific process. So just like I mentioned, there's going to be peer review. So you'll be working together two groups uh, in one team. So the two groups work independently and then they peer review each other. So they work on the same project, but separately. And then for every step, there's two, every output, there's two stages. In the first stage, you submit your best work. So you've done your work with your group mate and you've um, figured out how to do things, and then you submit this kind of work. This work, I will not grade. The work is going to be submitted to peer review. So peer review by your uh, other group. So you will both provide and receive peer review from other students. You will receive peer review from teaching assistants. You will receive peer review from me. And you will receive peer review from people outside in the community. And we'll be using the latest tools and trends uh, if you work in some lab at HKU, perhaps this is not yet implemented in your lab. Hopefully you will bring this into your lab. But this is really state of the art, up to date information. We really work very hard for this to be uh, the best kind of tools up to date uh, in the way that we do psychological science. Another thing that I will, you know, you'll, you'll figure this out as, as we go. I will mention books, uh, but it's not these organized books that were given to me saying, teach judgment, decision-making, or teach advanced social psychology. Because when I flip through these books, I already know that there are some findings that don't hold up. These books don't update very often. And in the last decade, we know that there are some trouble with some of the findings over there, which is why I will collect stuff from books, but I will use up-to-date information in order to give you what I think 
is the most updated information, uh, the best evidence that we have. If you know something else, I want to know what it is. And I will urge you, I will encourage you to go out and seek your own uh, insights regarding this stuff. But what that means is that there are no more books with all these problematic findings from you know, decades ago. I will not ask you to buy anything, you know, they, you know to, to sit together with you. There's not going to be any exams with multiple choice uh, questions and all that. Plus, there's no instructor truth here. You can question me about everything. Specifically here, we'll even do a little bit of that in the second part. Everything that we do, we're going to figure out together in the classroom. So instead of telling you the experiment showed that, I'm going to run the experiment on you. I will ask you what your predictions are, and then we'll figure out together whether this has worked or uh, worked or didn't work. We'll do this a lot on Mentimeter. So it's a very simple experiment in judgment decision making. One of the really nice things about judgment decision making is that we can demonstrate everything pretty easily. So now we have a fairly nice sample of about 20 students, hopefully a few more on Zoom. Uh, and that should be enough in order for me to demonstrate some trends in judgment decision making. But it is going to be in-class experiments involvement with you reflecting on the process by actually taking part in it. Open science principles, like I said, share everything. Everything is open. Um, we focus on uh, rigor. So a lot, a lot of times in other scientific, uh, uh, you know, in some labs or in some courses, they want you to be, uh, you know, focus on novelty. Show us something new. Uh, look at the theory and give, the, give us the gap. Or summarize the literature and then take the next step. Here, I don't want you to take the next step. I don't want you to do a lot of novelty. We are going to have extensions, but the first most important thing is for us to validate that we're standing on solid foundations. So first of all, is repeating and validating everything that we have and everything that we know. Um, okay, so it involves real research projects. What kind of projects are you going to do? Uh, three kinds of projects. Uh, in the first one, we're gonna run replications and extensions. So I will give you a classic article in judgment and decision-making that has been cited hundreds of times that the literature thinks is solid, that is in every uh, book on judgment and decision making. And I will ask you to uh, design a replication that follows everything that the article did from beginning to end, and then add your own little extension. And we have a very clear guide on how to add extensions to that. Could be a, a variety of points. But first of all, it's being able to look at an article, analyze this article, and then take another additional step. So first validating and then in, in, increase. The second one is science assessments. So I will ask you to look at how others have done replications. So look at the original, look at the replication, and then see what the difference is in the implementation, in the science, in the methods, in the open science, and so forth. Plus, we have a lot of community resources, templates, guides, and books, uh, and everything is Google Docs. So even when you use my template, my guide, it's our collaborative work. And actually, at the end, when we submit this to journals, if you contributed, if you added something, if you changed, if you found an error, you add your name, and then you're a co-author. So everything that we do is open, collaborative with the entire community, both our students and people um, in the world. Who is involved? Um, so right now, there are 50 people from around the world that are going to help you do good projects. So you can see a variety of countries from New Zealand and uh, Australia to uh, North America, Europe, and Brazil. Uh, hopefully we'll grow into other continents as well, uh, Central America, Africa, and so forth. But it's a growing community. And some of these uh, are uh, big researchers. So for example, one name is uh, Daniel Vassal over here that um, um, has done a lot of things and we'll talk about some of his findings, but most of these people are early career researchers. So PhD students, postdocs, same uh, level as I am, assistant professor, who are really passionate about open science, really passionate about validating our findings. So they will help you with this. In addition, there are some guided thesis students that worked with me on this project and all the students that uh, took my courses so far, about 300 of those. Now, the reason why I'm sharing this whole thing with you is because I want to explain that this is really a team that works together and we publish these things. 
So uh, we submitted the work that was done from the first year when I joined in 2018. And in the last year, we've published 15 of those. Um, so you can see that the model is that everybody that's underlined, all the underlined names are students. The first one that's uh, italicized is uh, the early career researchers, but the star means that all of them are first co-authors. And then finally the TAs after that, and then me trailing in the back. So we take the work that you do in this course, and we submit to the journals, and we make sure that it follows all the process in order to bring this to publication. This is only to show you if this is published in these journals, and these journals are some of the best in judgment decision-making in social psychology, it means that students can do work that meets the quality of the best journals in the field. So the beginning when I started out, people told me, who are you? What is this Hong Kong University? Who are these undergraduates uh, over there in Asia? We don't know what the quality is. This is never going to work. But this is a real demonstration that you can do high quality work that meets the best journals in, in our field. In addition, a lot of preprints. This is just 2020. In 2021, there's a, a lot more. If you want to see the entire list, you can go and, and visit here. I think this year, we might have even, even more than that. How many did we do? We did about 80 of those. So all together, there's like 100 replications and extensions. This makes our little project one of the biggest projects in judgment decision-making in social psychology. And this has had, has had uh, a real impact on the field. So right now in the world, there's not a lot of people who are doing replications, not a lot of people who are assessing the literature. So Hong Kong University, you, the students at Hong Kong University, are leading these efforts. So we ran something like uh, 70,000 participants. There are also a lot of projects that are what's called registered reports, and I'll explain later in the course what these registered reports are. And um, I won't show you stats right now, but later I will share a little bit of what our findings are uh, for these replications. Um, in judgment and decision-making, I'll share with you a lot of classic phenomenon. And if I am sharing something with you, and I'm telling you, I think this works. It's not because I read this in a book. It's because one of the 80 that we've completed, we've done this hands-on and we've verified that this actually works. So these are the things that we verified already. So everything that I'm sharing with you, it's not because somebody told me, it's because I did this together with you, with students, in order to make sure that this is solid and reliable. In the next semesters, I will be able to share what it is that you've done in this course. We have a lot of resources. I know it's a bit overwhelming, but each one of those is, could be up to 100 pages of how to do replications, how to do extension, how to calculate effect size, how to do confidence in the world, how to design a study. So taking you step by step, all tricks, everything else, there's guides and templates for everything, and everything is a Google Doc. So if you see an error, you can correct it. If there's something missing, you can comment and tell me to add it and I will add it. If you see something that you can contribute, you can contribute. So if I would do this on my own, it would be still be two, three pages, but because students contributed, because the teaching assistants added, because the entire community has access to this, this is very, very comprehensive. So use all of these for your projects. If you wanna see some examples of the projects uh, in this uh, course, very impressive stuff. I'm uh, you know, every time I see what students are capable of, I'm just like blown away. So you can scan this or later at home, go and click uh, this link. Everything that they've done, all the presentations, all the projects for the three components, everything is shared with you. Uh, you will be doing new projects. So this is not something that you can just, you know, copy and, and paste, but you can learn from what it is that they've done. And you can see the process of how they went through each one of the steps. So you're not the first ones to go through this. This will show you that this is doable, this is possible. If you wanna go back further, 2019, there's a difference between the 2020 and the 2019. In 2019, we actually did the entire data collection and the analysis, everything in one semester. In 2020, in this semester, we're going to do the first stage of a research project, what's called the registered report stage one, and we'll explain this to you uh, later. And we take that first stage before data collection, 
and we submit that to the journal. So the journal helps us to improve the methodology. Once the journal approves this, they give us what is called an in-principle acceptance, meaning that it doesn't matter what the results are, failed, success, found something, didn't find something, it doesn't matter, it's still going to be published. So you will be working on a registered report stage one before data collection, where we can get peer review also from experts and the journals. Some reactions. So when I share this, so the question is, when we do replications of some work, what are the reactions by the original authors? And I wanted to show you that some of the original authors are very enthusiastic about what our students uh, have done. So for example, over here, um, I showed some of the work from 2018. So this was really the first year that we did anything. So thanks for sharing your students' work with us. I'm truly amazed by the quality of the work. I don't think our first year PhD students could have done anything like that. And I agree, because when I look at my PhD work, <laughs> I'm very embarrassed to say that most of the stuff that you do, most of the stuff that Hong Kong University undergraduate students do as early as second year is better than some of the stuff that I did in my PhD. Back then, I was not aware of what is open science. I didn't even think about doing uh, open data, open code. I didn't know what is a power analysis. So things have changed in the last decade. So what you do now really is above and beyond what some of the older scholars uh, have done in their, in their PhDs. So they assumed that I gave a lot of guidance and I did not. I provide help and give templates and, and, and um, guides, but I, I really, all of this work was by the student. So she deserves all the credit. And I really like this, that they should consider doing this with their PhD students. I don't know why we're not doing this with our PhD students in the psychology department. I've been trying to get the department to do this, but it's going very, very slow, but at least they're letting me do this with undergraduate students. So that's nice. In addition, Don Moore, he's the, actually the person who wrote the book on judgment decision-making that we will not be using, but Don Moore, we tried to replicate some of his work and I like this reaction. So he's honored that we wanted to replicate the results. And after, we gave him the results. He says, please use these results to update your beliefs about my studies, which is brilliant. This is what we need to do. Don't just assume that what I published or didn't publish you know, 10, uh, 10 years ago, two decades ago is solid. Please replicate my work and then use this in order to inform yourself what works and what doesn't work. Some of the uh, reactions on Twitter, so I'm very active on Twitter. If you have Twitter or you use it, you're welcome to follow me. So. Whenever I post, and I post everything, everything that you do, every stage that you do, I go to the Twitter community and say, who wants to help us? Who wants to see what HQU students are capable of? And these are some of their reactions. This is just a, a small list. You can go on my teaching uh, a portfolio and see a very long list of very positive reactions to what it is that Hong Kong University students do. Some of the people who sign up to be external reviewers after they go over your work, they're amazed and they've, done work, they've done a PhD, they've done a postdoc, they're still amazed by the quality and the standards that you're able to meet. Not only that, but we also get some media attention. So this is, for example, from the British Psychological Society. Uh, so they summarized some of our findings. So you can see over here that we did, we're going to talk about what this is. It's called the bias blind spot. The people are not aware that they have biases. And uh, we're going to discuss what this means. We're going to try and see how biased we are. Uh, and this is nice because uh, over here you can see uh, Prasad actually did his PhD uh, together with me. He's now a postdoc at, uh, it was called Open University. I think yesterday they changed it to Metropolitan University of Hong Kong. Um, and over here, Xiao Kit Yong, he was a student, undergraduate student for both judgment decision-making and advanced social psychology. He later wanted to do an MPhil. So he asked me if he can work with me. We worked together for two years, now he graduated. But this is the first project that he did. And a few months ago, this was also published. So it's nice to see that the work by the students is uh, recognized. Psychology Today as well. I'm just going to read the summary to you because I want you to believe that you're able to do this. So I'm particularly impressed by the work because not only was this replication attempt done right with pre-registered plan, complete transparency, including open data, and a theoretically interesting extension, 
This is good evidence that rigorous applications can be run by researchers who do not yet have a PhD. So this is one of my guided thesis students. Remarkable work. Not only that, but even without the replications and extensions, the work that you do, nobody else does, which is very concerning because nobody looks at our literature and looks at the details enough to ensure that this is valid. So for example, when our students go over their replication target, over the article, sometimes they find mistakes. Sometimes they find misalignment between the table, the figures, and the text. Sometimes they find things that don't make sense because I will train you how to do a power analysis, how to calculate effect sizes. So sometimes they look at the effect sizes and say, this doesn't make any sense. So for example, they found problems with one of the big findings by a very prominent researcher in judgment decision making, Dan Ariely. And we uh, submitted the replication plus our analysis of the original. Uh, they did not want our replication for some reason. They have their own uh, consideration. But they were very worried by the errors that were detected by undergraduate students at Hong Kong University, which led to an expression of concern. So this is the headline, prominent behavioral scientist paper earns an expression of concern. You can go in and have a look. And this is students. Students found this, not me. So it's amazing when you look at the literature, when you know what you're doing, when you evaluate things, when you assess, that you can find things that nobody found since 2004 in one of our best journals. Remarkable. It just shows that we need to do a better job. We need to have more people looking at these things. We have to do more applications and more assessment, which is why you're doing what you're doing. This is my summary when they ask me what I feel about this. So I said, students and early career researchers are the key to this credibility revolution. They are most underappreciated, underutilized stakeholders. So you can go and read my reaction. The nice thing is that Dan Ariely, they asked him, what do you think about this? And he was very positive about this. So the expression of concern is by both the journal and Dan Ariely says, this is the way that science should progress. Please help me find errors. Just imagine if he would find this in 2004 when this was published rather than in 2021. It's not nice to find that an article that you published 15 years ago, everybody that built on top of that actually has errors. It's not pleasant for our scientists to have this kind of, so of course they're very grateful when we're able to find, better find this now than in 20 years from now. So <clears throat> this is regarding our course. Another warning, I think I mentioned this, there is, there is no individual criteria. So a lot of students at Hong Kong University are used to coming to a course, sitting back, you know, observing, you know, observing uh, information, uh, just uh, you know, listening to, to a lecture. And finally, there's a multiple choice exam and then they study the night before and then they dump everything in the following day, they forget. We don't have anything like that. This is 100% teamwork. So everything that we do is all these projects that we need to work on together. The one individual, uh, individual factor that will be taken into account is that you will evaluate each other's group work. So if there is uh, free writing or anything else that affects the, the, the work, we need to know about this and this will align your uh, group uh, grade. So your group grade can be very high, but if you didn't contribute, it will go lower just for you as the person who did not contribute. So um, in order to address how to do teamwork, uh, it's very important, I think, as an undergraduate student to learn how to do group work because when you go into industry, when you go into real life, everything is about teamwork, group work. So we'll teach you how to do team contracts, how to set a schedule, how to align expectations, how to talk to other students in order to make sure that you understand one another in order to achieve the goals of the group, plus there's team evaluation, so we'll ask you to assess one another. And then finally, at the end of the course, we'll ask you to reflect on the journey of what it means for you to work as, as a team. Uncertainty and uh, guided self-learning. So some students have the expectations that the uh, instructor will give them all the information. This is not going to happen in this course. We are working together. I will guide you, I will give you whatever experience I have, but most of, the, most of the work relies on you and it involves uncertainty. 
And some of the evaluations, I should say, uh, mention all kinds of things like, I don't know what to do with this uncertainty. This is a lot more uh, higher load than what I'm used to. I just want to sit with my book, memorize this, and then dump this into an exam. It's not possible in this course. It will require you to go every week, almost every week, there's something that you will need to do. Uh, you can't just decide to wait till the last moment in the semester. It's an ongoing uh, work. But if you do this well, you'll be able to have low uh, um, workload throughout the semester rather than one very large uh, workload at the end of the semester. Some people found this uh, to demand. Some people need more structure. If that's you, maybe this is not the course for you. But if you're willing to learn from the uncertainty, if you're willing to embrace this, if you're willing to collaborate with other people in order to overcome real challenges, then this is the course uh, for you. Why would you want to go through this? So you will learn a lot, I guarantee this. You can talk to other people who took the, the courses uh, last year. Uh, you get to understand and experience science. So after this, you will have a completely different understanding of what science is. You will be able to read evidence, see all sorts of things about the pandemic, about vaccinations, even things that are not in psychology. Suddenly an effect size will mean something to you. Suddenly a p-value will say something to you. Some days you will be able, able to look at evidence that is not in psychology and say, something here doesn't make sense to me. So it's very important for us, especially in the age of misinformation, to be able to sort what is reliable from what isn't. And this course will give you some uh, good skills uh, to train you how to do this uh, kind of thing. Plus, and I can't emphasize this enough, what you do is not going to be forgotten after you finish this course. It has real impact. It will continue after you finish this, this class. If you want to uh, get the perspective from a student, not from me, so Psychology Today, we have a column in Psychology Today. Actually, if you want to write after the course, during the course, for Psychology Today, you're invited to come in and talk to me about this. We'll love to, to put your post out there in Psychology Today. So this is Rihanna. She's still in our department. She's a master's student. She's graduating. So you can see Rihanna reflecting on her journey in open science and how she did replications. And her replication was accepted for a journal. If you want the perspective of these 50 early career researchers, you can read Jane. She did three replications uh, with us and she reflects on her own journey. Uh, and all that. If you prefer a YouTube video rather than a Psychology Today uh, uh, post, uh, this is Adrian uh, from France, and uh, he's one of the early career researchers that has helped us. He will be peer reviewing some of your work, so he's very active in our team, and he shares some of his experience. So uh, it's really nice to hear him talk about how he joined, what he learned, what it means to work with students, what he got from working with you, with the students. So this summarizes my very long introduction to why we're doing what we're doing, what is going to happen in this course. I strongly recommend that you go into the syllabus, that you go over this in detail and make sure that this is the course for you. Hopefully I gave you some motivation for why this is important, but I'll completely understand uh, no hard feelings if you feel that this is not for you. If you have some questions, we conduct everything on Slack. So we don't want you to uh, send one email to me and then somebody else will not know what the answer is that I gave you. So everything that we do, all our communication is open. So you can ask me a question and I will respond. Sometimes I will tag the teaching assistants, uh, but then you'll be able to see all the uh, communication between all of us. This is, of course, for the coursework. If you have personal questions about how you know, something that relates only to you, then you can uh, email me that everything is supposed to be open. So. If you have questions about this course, if you have doubts, that's great. I want to know about that because every time you ask me a question, I can help everybody learn from your concerns and from your questions. That's it for this part. Before I go on, we actually start talking about judgment and decision making. Uh, any questions, something that you want to ask about the process? Yes, please. Yes, so, I, so the question was, just for the Zoom folks, um, is, is there going to be actual content here or everything is done through the project, students working alone? So um, the content in this lecture, this is actually a really good question. We'll do some of it right now. So this is the second part for me to demonstrate a little bit what the process is going to look like. There is content, 
but I will not give you the content before you go through the actual thing. So I want you to adopt a scientist mindset, to have your own predictions, to come up with your own study designs. So I will encourage you every time to think, how can we study this phenomenon? Something interesting is happening here. How can we design an experiment in order to study this? We'll run these experiments on one another. So we'll do this in the classroom in order to see, does this work, does not work? And then I'll ask you to reflect on this. After that, I will tell you what we found. Does this align with what we found or not align with what we found? So I will connect this to knowledge, but before I tell you what my knowledge is, I want you to be able to think about this, reflect about this, come up with your own ideas. Does that answer kind of that? Yeah. Very good question. Anything else like that? Cognitive bias. Uh, just so I get kind of like a feeling, uh, how many of you have taken any classes on cognition and have heard of cognitive biases, something in psychology? Familiar some, somewhat? Can you tell me a little bit, for example, what, what did you, what do you know about cognitive biases? Terrific, yeah. What, what's a, if you can remember some kind of an example? For example, when we make uh, decisions, we, uh, we're not so rational. We uh, sometimes will let in relevant factors to influence our decision making. Mm. Yeah, very good. So that's some things that affect our judgment and decision making. Can you give an example? Um, for example, anchoring effect. Anchoring effect, yes. Good. So don't, don't say just yet what this is, but this is something that we'll, that we'll talk about. So definitely anchoring effect. Just, just so we all understand, what, don't tell what the bias is, but what makes this a bias? What makes this a bias? Yeah, what is the bias thing about this bias? Why do we call this a bias? Because, uh, I think it's because when we make decisions, we should consider most important factors. But Mm -hmm. uh, we take this uh, uh, irrelevant factors as, uh, as an anchor to influence our rational decision. Right. So something we're faced with a choice. Uh, if we were a robot and we would compute this rationally based on some equation of utility, we would be likely to choose one option over the other. But if we manipulate something that's completely irrelevant to the choice that comes from outside, then it might shift our preference from one choice to another choice, right? Do people usually, are they aware of, of this thing happening to them? No. They're not aware. So this is an important thing. Thank you for that. The important thing about cognitive biases is that there's, there's really something that's happening in our mind that we're not completely aware of. It's a little bit difficult, more complex to talk about this in psychology, judgment, decision-making, in social psychology. But in some, in some other fields, in psychology, it's much easier to see some of that. So are you familiar with the McGurk effect? How many of you are familiar? One? Yes? Good. So McGurk effect is not really <laughs> so much to judgment, decision-making, but it is something that happens automatically that we don't understand very easy to observe, but we can't turn it off because every time that we are faced with this, it keeps coming up. So I'm gonna show you a quick video. Hopefully that will demonstrate uh, the effect uh, and what it means to have a cognitive bias. Okay, so a very, very strong effect, very difficult to turn off and it's very uh, impressive when you experience uh, this kind of thing, when you see it in front of you, especially when it's one next to the other and you focus on one and you focus on the other. And then you realize that reality is our own construction. Everything that we think that we see is happening in our brains. We already know that reality depends on us because there's so much that we depend on in the world that we know from, let's say, other animals. Dogs can hear all sorts of things that we don't hear. They can smell all sorts of things that we don't smell. So our cognition is actually very, very limited, and it's affected by all sorts of things in the environment. And even when we are aware of this, so he has been studying McGurk effect for a very long time, and he can't turn this off. So some people are saying, you study judgment and decision-making, so you don't have any biases. 
sometimes the people who study judgment and decision making are more biased than anybody else. It doesn't matter if you know what the bias is, it's very difficult to turn it off for everything else. So maybe if I see that specific scenario or that specific decision, I can try and overcome myself. I can try and convince myself not to think in this way. But these biases happen to us regardless because our brain happens in a certain way. This is a very strong effect. It's very easy to replicate this effect. Some of the effects in judgment decision-making are much harder to observe and study and, uh, and see. Um, since we're in the TikTok uh, generation, uh, it was a tragedy when TikTok decided to, to close things up in, in Hong Kong. It's a real shame, but the good thing is that TikTok also kind of, if it's really famous, then it also gets to YouTube and we have access to YouTube. So I'm going to show you some TikTok demonstrations of this McGurk effect uh, that are a bit uh, funnier, but even more extreme than Ba and Fa. Was this long enough? So he recorded some, I think, uh, Manchester fans, and he, it, what, are, what are they saying? But if you present uh, the, the sentences, the very different sentences, Bart Simpson is something. <laughs> what is it? Bart Simpson is bouncing, rotating pirate ship. That isn't my receipt. <laughs> so all this, if you just focus on reading that, this is what you hear the fans uh, yelling. After, I'm going to run this again. You tell me at the end what is that they're really yelling. That is embarrassing. 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 So which one is it? Bart Simpson, no, and I think it's that is embarrassing uh, over there, whatever they saw in the field uh, over there. They were not happy with their, with their team. Uh, one other, I think this is really interesting. green needle related to brainstorm i really don't know so lots of stuff like that on tiktok it's amazing to see what people are doing so these are not scientists that are studying the gurk effect they're recording all kinds of sounds and then they're doing this kind of tricks and these kind of things on tiktok get like millions of views if you want to be famous on tiktok just use some cognitive biases and judgment decision making it'll be a big hit um, so um, very, very interesting. If you want like a summary, there's like a million of those. So you can uh, go. Don't raise it! 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 So people really go crazy with this. So you can go and, and uh, visit this uh, later. Um, let me think. Like I'm curious who, who talks about this. How many of you have taken irrational this, uh, thinking as a common core? Yeah. Sorry. As well. As well. So it's like the third time that you're seeing some of this stuff. Yeah. yeah. So in this kind of like opening lecture, um, it's going to repeat some stuff. Maybe even some of the uh, second, the third, and the fourth. But increasingly, will increase complexity. Plus, it will be a little bit more, more uh, hands-on. So I think in uh, rational thinking, uh, they give you... Now, these are the results uh, rather than actually uh, engaging you in this. So uh, hopefully this will give you like a different a twist to it so that you, you're not bored. All right, good. So you've seen this in uh, irrational thinking, right? Uh, are you familiar with this? I think it's very famous. A lot of people, especially if they, they've taken psychology, uh, the question is, which uh, desk is longer? And what is the answer? 
the left one is longer. How many of you think the left one is longer? The right one is longer. None of them are longer. Okay, yeah. So we take a, a ruler and we kind of measure what is, and this is the same ruler you can play afterwards with the PowerPoint, but this shows 20 and this shows 17. So actually this is the shorter one. So it's, it's an illusion uh, that it's very difficult for our, our brain to override what it is that we, that we see. Um, over here, a uh, very famous illusion. So what color is, you know, each, each arrow is pointing to. So it does seem like this one is much brighter than the one above, but then we do this kind of thing in order to take away the context. So just like you said, context affects the way that we perceive things. So they're the same color, but of course, when we look at this, even though we know that they're the same color, it's very difficult to turn this off. And some people will say, but maybe you, you change the photo. Maybe you switched it in the second slide. It doesn't, but then we put something like this and then it's very easy to see that it's actually the same color. So many times people will question something when you point on and you say, this is a bias. And people are like, but how do you know that's a bias? Maybe you change something. Maybe so you need to come up with more clever ways of overcoming this bias. So maybe overcoming like this, people are like, ah, you played with something. It doesn't make a lot of sense, but you can take this and then actually do something like that. And then things become uh, clear. This is, I think, one of the most famous ones ever. So which, of course, is the larger of these two black circles. So it looks like the left one is much larger than the one on the right. But of course, the context, like you said, it matters. So we compare, our brain compares all the time, it compares everything. Um, in social psychology, we really care about comparisons to other people. So am I better than others? Am I less than others? I just want to be at least as good as others. And I want to be like others are, uh, stuff like that. So our brain is wired to have reference points about all sorts of things. And everything is within the general context. In social psychology, we focused about the social context. But over here, these two uh, black circles are identical. Now, I follow this guy for a very long time on Twitter. I strongly recommend uh, that you do as well. He studies these kinds of things. So he comes up with these amazing illusions that win a lot of prizes. Uh, occasionally, perhaps if you travel around the world and you go into a cognitive illusion museum, then a lot of his stuff is up there. I'm just going to show you a bunch of, of the stuff that I collected, but uh, you can see, uh, you know, some of it looks like it moves, but it doesn't really move. But if you like shift yourself from right to left, it feels like it's moving. If that wasn't strong enough, this is really strong. It's kind of like uh, makes you even dizzy a little bit when you're looking at this, but just shifting yourself right and left, it really feels like something is going on. But of course this is static. Nothing is determining this kind of movement, but a person like this understands everything that we're doing in our inner processing in order to understand how to construct an illusion that would create motion, even if there is no motion. And sometimes when we do judgment and decision-making, we try and look at a phenomena and understand it well enough so that we'll be able to conduct a manipulation that would result in people experiencing all sorts of things. Marketers are very good at this. So marketers know how to manipulate you in order for you to buy more things that you don't need for more money. I did my PhD in a business school and I felt increasingly uncomfortable with that direction. So I was in a management department and in a management department, they tried to squeeze out value from employees. So even when they talk about sustainability, even when we talk about work-life balance, talk about you know, important things, they talk about this as a means to increasing profit value for the company. One of the reasons why I shifted to social psychology and judgment decision-making is because I think it's our obligation, our duty to help the individual. The corporations have a lot of power. Nobody is helping the individual. A lot of things that we try to do in psychology is really do all kinds of interventions, all kinds of policies to help the little people, us, our friends, our family, to make better decisions, overcome all the manipulations by marketers, by corporations. 
Uh, it's not to say that marketers only care about that. I know some very good marketers that really care about helping people make better decisions, but there is a way of exploiting, of learning how people make decisions in order to uh, shift their preference into something else. And we need to use this power very, very uh, carefully. Other illusions, this is an interesting illusion. So one circle goes in one way, the other circle goes in another way. This is really interesting because all of the lines here are actually uh, straight, but our mind kind of bends uh, things and creates all sorts of, of paradigms. And in judgment decision-making, we'll also be able to see some of these bending when we know a line is straight, but then something happens to it and then suddenly it doesn't appear to be straight anymore. This is really uh, making me dizzy every time that I look at this. It really has motion. You don't even need to move your head too much in order to see what's going on. Amazing stuff. So learning how the brain works, learning how the visual system works, or learning how the auditory uh, system is connected to the uh, to vision helps you um, construct all sorts of things in order to demonstrate a phenomena and study this. Also shifts from right to left, really interesting stuff. Uh, and he explains how this is possible. So I don't understand everything that he talks about because I'm not a vision a researcher, but it's fascinating seeing the kind of stuff that he comes up with. Um, and it's, it's fairly simple. So it's basic principles. So after you follow him for a while, you'll be able, just like all these TikTokers, to construct your own visual illusion in order to come up with something funny or, or meaningful. So the, the basic point that's been repeated here is that even when we are aware of this, even when we know this, the person who's constructing these illusions is not um, you know, immune to these illusions. Even the person who constructed these illusions uh, is, is faced with this and is experiencing uh, the same thing. So by now we've seen a lot of things about vision and uh, audio and all that. Uh, now I'm going to ask you to uh, uh, take part in experiments. In order to take part in this experiment, you'll need your mobile or your laptop in order to open this. So it's done by Mentimeter. Very simple questions. This is classics from the... <clears throat> Let me just close this. Can you see the number? Seven, six, six, three, three, four, nine, six. So very basic uh, questions will increase complexity uh, all the time. So the question is, which group of organizations A or B had the larger total sales revenues in 2003? I don't know where you were in 2003. There's also a chance that you were not uh, at all in 2003. Uh, it's becoming a very old question to ask. So you don't have any knowledge about 2003, but you do know some of these corporations. So on one side in group A, you have uh, Reebok International. I don't know if Reebok is still popular nowadays, but it's Used to in 2003, these were the, like, the number one shoes. Uh, Hilton Hotel, Starbucks, we have at least one. We used to have two on campus. Uh, Radio Shack is a big chain. And Hershey Foods, I don't know if you eat Hershey chocolate, but in the US, that's a, a big thing. Uh, visited the Hershey factory a few times and went into their Wonderland rides. On the Group B, we have some anonymous, uh, uh, we don't. A lot of people don't uh, really recognize any of these. So Group B, Ocon Philippe, uh, American International Group, McSun. So when faced with this kind of um, uh, question, how, how do you make sense of this? How to, how to make a decision? Here? What was your thought process? What did you think about when faced with this kind of question? Okay. So you try and categorize these, whether these are consumer goods or perhaps finance related. And here, which ones are consumer goods? Starbucks consumer goods and Hershey goods, which are the finance ones? Okay, how did, how did you know that there are finance ones? Oh, you Google them. Okay. Okay, so if we compare consumer products to finance, uh, what, what is the bigger one? Which one makes more money? Which one has better revenue? Probably a financial one. Okay, thanks for sharing that, terrific. Any other um, insights on how to make this kind of decision? How do we know A or B, yes, please? Yes. 
oh, you think in 2003, Starbucks maybe wasn't doing as well. And the other ones that we don't know about? Okay. Which one? B. So B is bigger revenues because you don't know much about them. And you're thinking perhaps the ones that you do know something about time somehow in the past, they weren't doing as well as what here. So really, really interesting um, to, to think about these kinds of things. Let me see if I can, I don't know what aren't the shortcuts. Thank you. Okay. So most of you uh, thought that these are, uh, you know, Reebok, International Hilton Hotels. So if we actually do like uh, a statistical test, this is not likely to be significant because we have a very small sample, but visually descriptive, you can look at this and you can say, yeah, okay. So we found that this group believes that this is more than this one. Now your predictions uh, uh, before, when you look at this kind of thing. So, what do you think is this representative of what most people in the world would think in this kind of situation? And why? If I go to a group of students in, let's say, Princeton, Yale, wherever in the world, the Maastricht University, will they think about this the same way that you do? So when I ask you this kind of thing, you need to think like a scientist and say, how do we know if what we experienced here in this classroom generalizes to other contexts? What could be the phenomena? What could be the McGurk effect? What could be you know, the small circles around the black circle that would affect people to choose A over B or choose B over A? Is there something here that is shifting preferences? And in this case, there is. So what could be shifting? So some people said, of course, you can uh, look at uh, things up, but categorizing all kinds of things. So one category could be one is consumer goods and the other, we don't know. Maybe we need to look it up. But another thing that is very easy to think about a category is we know these names and we don't know these names. When we know something, immediately our mind does all kinds of tricks. And especially because these are very successful. We're thinking, we're not just uh, successful now, but they're also successful, very successful in 2003. Our mind tells us that this is likely to over-dominate everything. However, this differentiation between consumer goods and finance, actually, all of these brands are owned by these brands who own them plus a lot of other businesses as well. So these are the anonymous big names behind these very familiar brands. So actually, many of these groups have a lot of, of, of brands. Now, even when we think about things like Google, actually they have a parent company that includes both Google and other things. So most of these familiar brand names also has a finance, you can call this, but an investment group that actually nobody uh, from the street usually knows these names because they're not familiar brands that own the familiar brands plus many other things like say finance. So these investors actually are the ones that are running all these smaller brands. So what is happening here? We're making familiarity affect the way that we process information in terms of when we are faced with situations of uncertainty. So there's uncertainty because we don't know anything about this group. So how do we make sense of this? We rely on heuristics and biases of what's easily available, cognitively available to us. So we're thinking, did we see this before? What do we know about the situation? Oh, I'm familiar with Reebok. I'm familiar with Starbucks. Therefore, I take Starbucks every day when I go to campus. Therefore, they must be very successful. A lot of things that are happening, even with the, the pandemic, you know, even when we make decisions about our health, we tend to stick with stuff that's familiar and we don't Google our uncertainty. We don't try and make sense of this because we already know. We know that Starbucks is familiar. We know that Starbucks is successful. We know that Starbucks makes uh, coffee that we drink every day. Therefore, uh, I will go with the Starbucks option, although they could be, and just next to the campus, some really good coffee shop, artisan coffee shops that might even cost less and higher quality. So sometimes availability heuristic, this is what this is called, is affecting uh, our perception. <clears throat> another, another question. 
And this is uh, from my experience doing the MBA in Israel. I'm Israeli, I grew up in Jerusalem. Um, so the best student in my MBA class in Israel wrote poetry and was rather shy and small in size. Do your best to guess what is the student's undergraduate major? Is it Chinese studies or is it economics? So here there's a different kind of uncertainty because you don't know what Israel is like. You don't know anything about my MBA class. You don't know anything about me, but you need to make an assessment. You need to make an educated guess. So here I want you to uh, think about two things. First, what is your intuitive answer? Don't try to play with this too much. Just try to think, what is the first thing that came to mind with these two things? Then try and predict what other people in the classroom are going to say. So this is adopting a scientist mindset. You make predictions, not just about what it is that's happening with you, but also what's happening to people around you. What is your prediction here? Not about yourself, but about others. What is the prediction? Try and make a prediction. Chinese studies versus economics. What's the difference between them? Which one is more popular here at HKU? Sorry? Economics more popular than Chinese studies? So if we think about a place like Israel, which one is more popular? Perhaps Chinese studies more than economics? You don't know, right? So this is one differentiation, which one is more popular? Now, when we think about the kinds of people that take certain classes, when we think about some, somebody who takes economics, what kind of person do we visualize? Who takes economics? Yes, please, don't, you don't need to raise your hand. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, so people who study economics know statistics. Anything else? Sorry? People who study economics are more rational? Okay, anything else about their habits, about their lifestyle, about the way that they are, their personality? How, do, how would you categorize somebody who studies economics, yes, please? Yeah, you, yeah, go ahead. We tend to associate them with what? She said creative, more creative. Econ people who study economics are more creative than people in less. Okay, why is that? Humanities, philosophy, art, all this, yeah. Okay. So we think about art and creativity. We make these kinds of associations. Anything else about the differentiation? So when we look at this kind of like uh, road poetry, is that indicative of, of being an artist, being more? Uh, so it seems to kind of align with our expectations of somebody who studies uh, Chinese studies, right? So this was deliberately made in order to appear is if it more aligns with Chinese studies than it does with the economics. So the basic assumption here and the major prediction here is that people will shift their preferences towards Chinese studies. But why is that considered to be a bias? What is the problem here? Like you said, sorry, it's an MBA class. First of all, even if it's not an MBA class, like we understood from HKU, and it's even worse in Israel, not a lot of people study Chinese studies. A lot more people study economics, right? Especially MBA class. Like what are the chances that this Chinese studies uh, BA <laughs> graduated and now he's gonna move into doing an MBA? He's an artist, right? So a lot of things over here shift our preferences to Chinese studies, but there's something called the base factor. So when we look at the population and we look at the rates of how many people in the MBA class actually studied economics before, a very large proportion of those. So uh, interesting to see the results. So here we have about half and half, but if we would all be rational and we would look at the base factor and think about it rationally, we would expect you know, economics much higher proportion in MBA compared to Chinese studies, but some of us kind of shifted towards it. So it's not a 100%. It's not the McGurk effect that happens every time. Some of you are able to overcome this kind of thing. So not everybody shifted, but some of you shifted because you were affected by the description. 
But of course, even in economics, when we look at those, so you don't only look at the economics, uh, how many people are uh, in the MBA, how many people are from economics and how many people are Chinese studies, but we also use the stereotypes. And then we combine these two together in order to have a good evaluation because a lot of things are missing over here. The best information that we have actually is that this is an MBA class and this was a student. So we kind of need to construct how many people generally study Chinese studies. In Israel, I can tell you, maybe there's two. <laughs> Every year, maybe there's two. Economics, one of the biggest in, uh, I was at the Hebrew University. So in Hebrew University, economics like top. Um, so economics is going to dominate, but here we shifted. Uh, I also added another one. I think it's uh, like uh, much easier to see this over here. What would you uh, predict that people would answer here? What's your prediction about how people would answer? For some reason, people perceive stereotype that women are more poetic, they're more artistic. Uh, they're definitely smaller in size, but unfortunately, when I was taking my MBA, I don't understand that. But there's a real uh, glass ceiling. Even when taking the MBA, uh, it requires five years of management uh, uh, experience. So um, not a lot of uh, females. So in psychology, I did a psychology undergrad in computer science. In psychology, I was one of the few males. There was three males in a, a year of 100. In computer science, uh, there were three females in a whole year. And uh, economics, for some reason, MBA, uh, a lot of uh, male-dominated male uh, profession. So if we just look at the base rate, it should be uh, male. But because of the stereotype, people kind of shift uh, towards the, uh, the female. So all kinds of biases come into here. But basically, when we look at the very um, elusive uh, description, um, we kind of we, we try and make sense of an uncertain situation. And we have all sorts of biases. Uh, we put more emphasis, for some reason, on what is rather shy and small in size and writes poetry. Then we do just evaluating that this is a student and an MBA and what the background is. How, what is the representation of male and female in an MBA class? Uh, I think also here at uh, HKU, uh, the ratio for females, unfortunately, is, is low. Okay, so we still have uh, 15 minutes. I'm just gonna summarize this. Do you wanna know more about this? So, um, a book by Max uh, ba Bazerman, uh, it's called Judgment in Managerial Decision-Making. So this is one of the examples that I took from that book. It has a lot more uh, interesting um, uh, findings over there, but this is one of the examples for a phenomenon that later received the Nobel Prize for Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. So in the history of psychology, there's only one person that won the Nobel Prize for economics, and this is Daniel Kahneman. He would have won this with Amos Tversky if Amos Tversky would still be alive. So uh, Nobel Prize was in 2002. Uh, Daniel Kahneman received this, but Amos Tversky passed away in 1996. Uh, interestingly, which is why it's kind of like I relate to their personal story. They started from the Hebrew University in Israel. There's a, a really nice book right now about uh, their personal journey of you know, growing up in Israel and then how they made their career, but received the Nobel Prize. So Daniel Kahneman, this is one of the first demonstrations of uh, heuristics and biases in judgment decision-making. He's the one who founded uh, the field together with Amos Tversky in the 1960s. So this is one of the uh, amusing demonstrations that they uh, used to do. They also showed, and this is really funny, they also showed that when they go to statisticians, conferences, when they go to experts and they ask them these kinds of questions, even experts make these kinds of, of mistakes. Um, another experiment, uh, it's not on uh, Mentimeter, so we're gonna do this uh, rather quickly, but uh, between the years uh, 1990 and the year 2000, please try to rank and estimate the following causes of death in the United States. So the United States around this uh, uh, time was about 300 million. I think now it's 330, 340 million. So just try and rank them. What is the least leading cause of death with, uh, in that decade, the 1990s? 
Uh, is it tobacco? Poor diet and physical activity, uh, motor vehicle accidents, firearms, or illicit drug use. So let's just focus on number one. What is the number one killer in the US? Sorry? Accidents, which one? Motor vehicle accidents? Do you agree with him? No? Some of some tobacco? What, what's, what's the reason? What's your guess? You, you nodded no. <laughs> Poor diet and? And inactivity? Okay, interesting. So when you said motor, motor uh, accidents, why, why did you choose uh, accidents? Of why is this number one? Okay. So now we understand kind of like your intuitions. What do you think people's intuitions are? So now you're a scientist, you're making predictions. If we give this to the average uh, person and we ask them, what's your prediction? What do you think they will focus on? What is the number one? Yes, please. Firearms, why is that? Yes, so the prediction was uh, firearms because this is uh, something recent that happens that was on the news that people kind of can, can see that is happening around them. When is the last time that you heard of somebody dying from tobacco on the news? Doesn't happen very often, right? So if we try and categorize these different things, definitely firearms is a very you know, media worthy kind of uh, thing. Nobody really talks about tobacco and poor diet. Why, why don't we talk about these? Why aren't these in the media? You said that you kind of, uh, you know, your stereotype or the way that you think about Americans and their diet perhaps leads you to think about this. But why is it that we don't see these in the news as much as let's say firearms? Chronic, yes, very good. What, what do you mean by that? Yes, it takes a very long time. Perfect, very good. So first of all, it takes a very long time. If you shoot somebody, they're dead. Another difference is you know exactly what caused this. If somebody died in the hospital after 20 years of, you know, sitting there, did they die from the diet? Is it because of heart disease? Perhaps it's something else. There's a lot of factors. It's very difficult to uh, quantify what is it that the person actually passed away from. But when we talk about these, these are very visual and they're very, very clear. You know who shot who. You know exactly what happened. So we tend to focus on these because they're media worthy. Media reports about them all the time. And we have this, we're gonna talk about the negativity bias, you know, negative thing is it's, like, it's very visual, it's very strong. It makes us worry and fear. Diet, you know, I don't think that the hamburger that I'm going to eat is going to cause a lot of trouble. But if somebody shoots me, if I go into a, a school and there's a mass shooter, it's definitely going to affect me. So we're all affected by this, but actually the ranking, this is the ranking. So actually the number one killer is tobacco, followed by the, the diet. And how many firearms are illicit drug use? This is very, very low, but this is what is reported on the news. We are being biased by the news. We're being biased by what is clear and what is not clear. We're being biased by something that is chronic or something that is immediate. So we have all these biases that are causing us to to really uh, not have a clear uh, ranking over here, but it's not only the ranking, but also in terms of the estimates. So tobacco is 10 times more than the vehicle accidents. You know, when we look at this, this is even, even lower than that. So people don't only uh, misjudge the ranking, but they also mis misjudge the, uh, the, the ratio. By, by a factor of how much is something, is something affected. So this is very easy to replicate. I can replicate this very easily in almost every classroom. So this is kind of like uh, brain teasers for you to kind of think about when we are faced with these kind of questions, what kind of things are affecting us? What is the McGurk effect or these visual illusions that are happening in our mind that are blinding us from seeing uh, what is uh, in, in front of us? And when we look at this, why is this happening to us? What can we make of this? Let's see if I have enough time. I don't have enough time. <clears throat> so I'll wrap it up. Um, in the following classes, I'm going to talk about uh, Daniel Kahneman, 
and Amos Tversky, and uh, all sorts of big theories like prospect theory that led to the Nobel Prize. Um, really interesting stuff, very easy to demonstrate. I think the interesting thing is that um, the reason why they won the Nobel Prize is because they showed that economics is biased. They are over-influenced by this assumption of rationality and not taking into consideration psychology. So basically what Amos Tversky and Kahneman uh, did is introduce psychology uh, uh, to people that do uh, economics. Uh, the way that Daniel Kahneman likes to uh, explain this, it's a bit simplified. Uh, it's a bit more complex than this. But he talks about system one and system two. So system one is this uh, very, I think there's a yeah, nice diagram. So the rabbit, intuitive, immediately when we see something, we're confronted by something without even you know, processing much, we already have a solution. So we see Reebok and Starbucks, we immediately think, okay, we know solution, F finish here, move on. Because I asked you to think about this, then maybe you stop a second and you think the turtle kicks in and then it's like, wait. So if he's asking us about this, perhaps there's more to this here. Maybe I need to override. But the first thing that, we, that comes to mind is this rabbit, is this system one, is this fast, um, um, effortless um, cognitive uh, processing. But if I ask you to stop for a second and think about this and adopt a scientist mindset, and make predictions and think about what is it that biasing you, then the system two kicks in and it kind of tends to override. Sometimes, and we'll see some examples for this in the next classes, sometimes system two overcompensates. So it doesn't like what system one is doing, so it's overcorrecting to go on completely the other side. So it doesn't mean that if you have a good system two and if you stop and think about everything, then everything is going to be accurate. Sometimes we overcompensate in the other direction. Uh, this is good. what we're gonna do next, uh, next class. We're, I'm gonna offer you some free money. We're gonna do some bidding. Uh, it's real money. You have a real chance to uh, win some money in this class. Um, and we're gonna try and make some predictions about uh, who's going to win, how much money. Uh, it's a chance for you to get some uh, real cash from the professor in this class. Uh, before we move on, um, just want to once again ask you to uh, go on the syllabus. It's very, very important. You can see the topics that we're going to deal with, some of the books that we'll be talking about. Um, see the contract, understand everything that you need to do. Um, you can decide if you want to stay or not. If you do want to stay, that's great. Perhaps you can start thinking about who would you like to work with. And if you know some others in the class, that's great. If not, we'll help you. The only uh, request that I have for your groups, so we have uh, a group of two. We have two groups uh, in each team. So four people, two uh, people in a group, two groups in, in a team. So try and see if you uh, are familiar with the other people in the group. If you don't have somebody, we'll help you. The request that I have is that... Um, I think we'll try and group the remote people who are still not here uh, together uh, and then face-to-face uh, -face people uh, together just because uh, having somebody that's not present, um, it kind of affects the group work. If somebody's coming in a few uh, weeks, that's no problem. But if somebody is away for the entire semester, uh, then that's going to make it a little bit difficult. However, we'll see how many uh, we have. But do try and team with somebody that you... Uh, feel comfortable with that you can see face to face when you're here or people remote people that you can talk to uh, in remote and feel comfortable about that if you need help with any of this we'll be there for you uh, but we'll deal with this in the in the second week any questions so far to summarize this uh, introduction lecture terrific looking forward to seeing you next week